came as a request of how do we do labs online and so what we did is just reached out to some faculty and put a request out to the deans of who is doing that already successfully I and so we got it. some feedback there and uh, so we put this together and I appreciate our, our presenters today we've tried to get a variety of disciplines and, and we may have another one of these um, since we have had such a request and I think the main thing today is um, we're going to just get ideas and hopefully you'll be able to, regardless of your discipline, be able to implement some of those. One thing to keep in mind, taking a course online, whether it's a lab or just a, a regular course, it's not about exact duplication of what you're doing in your face-to-face. -face. Um, it, it's not trying to duplicate it, but it's to try, trying to arrive at your, your outcomes and meet those objectives. It'd be kind of like if you take a car, to a location versus you take a plane. Well, you're not gonna take the plane on the exact same route that you did your car, but you're going to arrive at the same uh, place. So anyway, with that, I will turn it over to Whitney Nettles um, in chemistry and let her begin by um, uh, sharing some of her uh, ideas and uh, what has worked well for her. Then after that, we'll go to um, Dr. Howard. So, Dr. Nettles, I will let you take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, so, some of the things that that we've done that we found to be very successful have been um, learning to use Canvas and to guide students through the lab experience um, in kind of a sequential order ordered fashion. Um, so, one thing I wanted to show you that we were using is um, this is a, a normal canvas page for our ch 1211 and we as you'll see we use the modules um, to organize per lab experiment and under edit for a module you can add prerequisites and requirements um, and i'll show you one with those um, you can see where we we can make the students go in a sequential order and they can do the pre-lab video and then the lab video and move into a pre-lab quiz and we can set requirements. The students must master that material um, or at least get 50% on this one um, before they can move on and, and perform post-lab. Um, and one reason that we've done this is mainly when students are struggling, if we kind of block them from going forward, they reach out to either us or their teaching assistant to kind of um, get that support that they need. Some other things that we have found to be really important, um, so kind of our, the approach we took with the lab was to go in with teaching assistants and film the lab experiment and one of the main things we focused on is um, having a 15 to 20 minute video link, nothing longer than that. Um, and so a two hour experiment becomes about 15 to 20 minutes of watching for the student. And uh, here's an example of a video. We've used a lot of private channel YouTube um, because YouTube is a master at compression for the students who, you know, they they might not have the bandwidth that they need um, to pull up videos. And so uh, this is just an example where Miss Brown, our Chem 1 instructor, um, made the video. And she used a lot of animations, as you'll see. And we allow the students access to the data and the information going to kind of skip forward just a bit um, to show you kind of the quality that you're going to want. You, you want it to be very visible for the students so they can see what's happening. Um, we feel that's really important, the whole point. And you'll hear the music, um, and I'll talk about that part in a second. But you can see the video quality is, is pretty amazing. Um, and she put a lot of animations in. Um, took a lot of time to make sure that, you know, the students were getting 
you know, that visual component. Um, but all of the data is also provided after the video as well. So we don't just rely on the students getting the data from the video. We, we mainly focused on this, um, or Ms. Brown mainly focused on making sure that they got that experience and they got to see what they would have seen. Um, and I, I think she did a, an amazing job on that. And one of the biggest things we found is, you know, your video quality has to be impeccable. Um, and so it takes a lot of time to, to get that quality, especially in a lab uh, setting. But as I said, you know, the video itself had music and what we found with talking with students, they really do kind of, it drones on with a lab video. Um, and so we, we've tried to branch out to find things that kind of keeps them interested. And music is one, animations, questions embedded in the video. Uh, Canvas allows you to embed questions um, in your, your, your posted videos if you post through uh, Studio. And so we've kind of used all of these. Um, and you know, keeping the students engaged has been one of our, our top priorities and making sure that they are able to move through the content and understand the content. Um, and so, you know, we've been providing a lot of support in that. Also, we've used, um, for our video editing, we use the Camtasia that's available through ITS. Um, you just go to ITS and you can download that and it does video editing for you. Uh, not for you, but it allows you to do video editing and it's free provided through the university. Um, and we do that a lot. I, I think the biggest thing is video editing is going to be your best friend and Camtasia allows you to zoom in on things that you're trying to get students to, to focus on like color changes or particular reactions. Um, and it allows you to zoom in on, on figures. Um, one of the things that we have found that has not worked very well, we did everything asynchronous. Um, so we recorded videos and things like that. And, and we're gonna continue that, but, but we need to incorporate a synchronous component to bring back students back in. Um, because we had a, a few that kind of just fell off and, and we really wanted to um, focus on, you know, getting those students back, having them someone to talk to. And so some of the things we were planning to do um, over the summer to kind of change things up to improve kind of the online experience is to have, you know, a, a tutoring center available throughout the week where uh, students can log in and, and get support from teaching assistants. And we plan on using Campus Not again. Um, it, it allows us to kind of group students sort of like a lab so they can communicate with their peers on a social media type platform that they are um, comfortable with. Um, other things that we found that just aren't going to work for students are, are the students that have gone through this semester trying to do the bulk of their work on their cell phone is just not uh, feasible um, and they've had a lot of trouble with that and so um, but that should be an issue that's cleared up over the summer um, as everyone can kind of plan a little bit. I would say one of the best components, one of the best ideas that we had um, for Ms. Brown and, and me and Dr. C. Nettles, uh, when we met, you know, it was very important for us to be able to sequentially walk students through and using that Canvas prereq and requirements in each module has just been um, a lifesaver. And over the summer, um, us incorporating TAs over sections of students through Campus Knot is going to allow us to have more interpersonal kind of communication where students have someone to reach out to. Um, and finally, one of the things that, you know, we're, we're working to incorporate as well over the summer, it's called Twitch TV. Um, We've all done office hours and tried to meet with students. Um, and what we found is um, students kind of want to remain anonymous a bit, um, especially when they're asking for help or, um, you know, have a question about the material. They, they don't necessarily want their name posted. And 
And if you, if you want to know who the students are, this might not be a good option for you. But what we found is Twitch TV, which doesn't, it doesn't have a video uh, for students. It, it just shows the instructor and it's a chat box and students post their questions in chat with the screen name they choose. Um, and, you know, it, it allows them to keep kind of anonymous uh, while the instructor is answering their questions. And what we found is that there's a much greater participation of students during office hours and help sessions in that type of environment, as, and as opposed to things like Zoom and WebEx and, and Teams, where it, it is a video and you're talking one-on-one. -on -one. They, they feel kind of exposed in, in that scenario. Um, but Canvas also allows um, for discussion boards where you can be anonymous and change your username but that goes across all courses and some instructors might not like that so um i think that's kind of the gist of it you know we had 24 labs that we had to record um for summer and we're we're finishing up the video editing for summer now it, it's many many hours of long work and i can't i can't express how impressed I've been with Miss Brown and, and Dr. Nettles. Um, they, you know, they have teaching assistants that have assisted them. And I, I think that not being afraid to reach out for support is kind of the biggest thing in, in learning these new tools. Don't, don't lock yourself into one tool. There are so many available and you need more than one uh, to make a really good lab experience. Oh, and um, just to say, we will be happy to send you any information that we have. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, there's, um, there's a couple of questions, um, Dr. Nettles, in the, the chat box. One was, what software did you use? Did you mention that in your um, editing your videos? Yes, we use Camtasia. It is available for free um, through the ITS website, uh, Mississippi State. Um, and this is probably going to be a question for 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 everybody, a very general question, but did, was there anything specific you did, you did for students who didn't have strong internet connection? Was that an issue for you at all? Did you do any kind of work around? It was, and, and the way that we kind of worked around it was using YouTube. So um, because it compresses the video so well, students had more access to it. When you go through uh, the ARC, um, if you upload the same video to ARC as you do YouTube, it's going to compress it to about half half the bandwidth requirements um, and that might be a slight over exaggeration um, but it, it significantly improved student access to the videos and and the way that we did this we just use private channels and so you just have to send that url to your students um, to access that channel but what I will say is Ms. Brown, you know, with these videos, she has, I think, had over 7,000 views. Um, she's been working with instructors across the country um, in helping them get material as well. So, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to us. We're, we're happy to send you whatever, you know, we have. And, and she actually has a, a video, I believe, on, on Camtasia editing. And so if you'd like that, um, it's just a short little help. Would you, when we uh, move on to the next presenter, would you put the URL to that video um, in the chat box uh, that had been requested, the one that you just showed, Absolutely. so they can they can use it? Um, and then another question was, um, did you provide data sets, um, and what are the students using to complete the lab activity? Can you do some of your viewing okay. videos? so we used um we did we provided some data sets um, for the lab reports themselves based off of the experiments that the students saw and um for organic and gen chem this is kind of where they deviate a little bit uh gen chem is where miss brown is and she put all data in she provided them all data um, after the video and they could access that once they completed the video 
Um, whereas with organic, um, Dr. C. Nettles, he took a little bit of a different approach where they could retrieve all data from the video. And he made sure that, you know, the information, if it wasn't visible, he would just annotate in the video what that value was. Um, but the students had to pull the data from that. And the reason for the difference there was our organic labs have to write a full lab report. And so there is no real data sheet. They pull the information and they write their own report and analyze. Gen Chem is a little different. Um, they actually have data sheets that they have to fill in. And so what we did was provide them the data and then they had to um, resubmit that um, with calculations and things like that. We had to take a different approach for this semester as we are the, uh, uh, over the summer. So this semester we used Google Docs to provide that data information to them. It, over the summer, um, we're going to have the bookstore with the availability to ship out their, their workbooks. We didn't know that students had their workbooks, so we just went ahead and put it in the proper form for them for this semester. Um, but over the summer, they will have those workbooks. And so we can just give them that information in, on Canvas. Um, and so it's a little bit uh, different between the two semesters, but we kind of made it work. <laughs> Excellent, thank you for sharing that. And um, there may be some other questions that pop up that if you wanna take a look at those, make sure I didn't didn't um, um, miss anything there, but thank you so much. Um, excellent information. And <clears throat> for the sake of time, we'll move uh, move right along to um, Dr. Isaac Howard in civil and environmental engineering. Dr. Howard, I will pass it on to you. Dr. Howard, are you, you may have been muted, but you are ready to go. All right, well, we will check back with Dr. Howard shortly then. <laughs> um, and we will go on then to um, Rowan Haug who will be next, and Dr. Haug is from um, ART. Yes, hello, you yeah. hear me? Yes. Okay, Excellent. hi, I'm Thank Rowan. Um, I teach uh, studio art, so I teach design one and 3D design, which is like intro sculpture, um, which you can imagine is maybe a little tricky to teach, um, not in person, <laughs> um, so. Just to sort of explain a little bit about what a studio class looks like normally. Um, usually I have uh, about five projects that the students do each semester and they have about two to three weeks uh, to work on them. So it starts off, I usually give a lecture with slides. Um, we have discussion and uh, a demonstration of tools and materials that the students will be using. Um, and most of these things are brand new, um, things that most students have never touched before, um, like a bandsaw, for example. Um, so uh, studio art classes are about three hours long, um, twice a week. Um, it is a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention with students and a lot of interaction between students. Um, it's sort of like the social media of <laughs> um, college. Right? There's a lot of talking, um, we know a lot about each other, um, and that really helps, I think, with sharing some, um, sharing our creative lives uh, uh, that the students will continue to do once they have graduated um, with an art degree. Um, so innovation in my class doesn't usually have much to do with technology, um, but it's more of a troubleshooting one-on-one -on -one with issues with materials. Um, and encouraging creative problem solving. Um, so 
other than saws and sanders, technology is never a part of my classroom. I, um, prior to this, had never once ever gotten on Canvas. So, um, I think Tina is on here and she can attest to the fact that I had a lot of questions and a lot of issues. Um, but, uh, so I sort of feel like I've been a student for the last uh, six weeks or so, but, um, so the two main issues that I saw, um, were one is, uh, that sort of social and discussion aspect of my classes. Um, each project concludes with a critique, um, which everyone is required to go to sort of participate in, and that becomes part of their grade. <clears throat> so each student is required to present their projects and everyone comments um, with constructive criticism. And so I saw that as being a, a sort of issue that was gonna be hard to duplicate. Um, but also adapting projects. So the projects that we were supposed to start right after spring break was a um, subtractive sculpture. So we were going to pour plaster and then um, sorry, uh, we were going to pour plaster and then carve it uh, with classroom tools. So within that one week time span, there's no way I could have really um, adapted that. And so, um, so that was the sort of second tricky thing. So to address uh, the first issue, let me see if I can screen share. Um, I sort of found Canvas and some other things that I looked at uh, a little clunky. A lot of people in the art department, um, mainly in graphic design, who use um, Canvas for their classes, use Flickr um, to upload images. And I found that a little tricky for me because I need multiple images uh, of each project since it's three-dimensional um, and something seemed a little bit more time-consuming and so I'm sure uh, the students uh, thought this was pretty funny um, but I created a Facebook private searchable group for each of my classes um, so they don't have to friend me it's searchable and um, no one can see it. so I'm gonna go I'm pretty sure most of us know what Facebook, oh, hold on just a second. Am I still there? Can you all hear me? Yes, you're there. Okay, sorry. Can you see my screen? No, we're still seeing you. Um, I don't think you've shared your screen yet. Well, I can't get back to it. So as you can tell, the technology and Rowan are not super uh, good friends, but so I created a private um, Facebook group for each class. And what's great about this is I can quickly upload YouTube videos. I can quickly, um, people can um, upload several images of their own work and we can have a threaded discussion about them. Um, and so in that way we were, uh, helps I think to um, get that critique sort of situation hold on I think I can get back to it now let's see my screen share okay you can see it now yeah okay so this is my 3d design for 11 a.m. I have reminded them are you guys watching your art 21 episodes um, I have students giving me their sketchbook ideas um, and we can comment on them showing them some examples and fun things that they should be looking at for inspiration. And so this kind of uh, takes the place of that social aspect, uh, that one-on-one -on -one aspect or group aspect that we have in class. Um, I'm pretty sure half the students uh, think it's pretty funny that we're doing this on Facebook since it's old people social media, but um, it works really great for us. And I've actually been really happy um, I feel like I get more responses via the critiques than I did actually in class. Um, I think it's a, a little bit of that anonymity. You're not right there in front of uh, your classmates. And so you can maybe say more um, or you're willing to say more than you would in class. Um, I also really love it because it's a second line of accountability for me. So they turn in their assignments on Facebook, but they also turn it in on the assignments through Canvas. 
So if I have students say, but I turned it in, I'm 100% positive I turned it in, it's on can it, but it didn't upload onto Canvas. I say, well, you had you have you have to upload it twice. <laughs> so I have it um, that sort of background uh, or second line of a, a accountability. The second issue I had was obviously with the projects. I could not uh, obviously teach them subtractive sculpture without them having chisels and carving tools. So. Um, I actually saw this kind of time of social distancing as an opportunity or a plus for some projects. So um, one is because they are sort of uh, alone or, you know, less alone, they're not distracted by people in the dorm room next to them or their roommates, and then several things that uh, we don't normally assign for class because I don't want to take up instructional time. So a lot of artist documentaries I've had them looking at. And one of them is a documentary by Andy Goldsworthy called Rivers and Tides, which uh, Andy Goldsworthy is an artist who goes out into nature every day and works directly with nature, um, really looking intensely at the sort of elements and principles of design that they can find in nature. This project does not work well in a normal classroom setting um, because I find that they just don't take the time and energy. Um, I've assigned it one other time and was pretty disappointed with the results. Um, because they don't want to go away from their friends and be quiet in nature. Um, and this sort of gives them this opportunity that they're already kind of required to be by themselves. So um, I had them upload so these are just some examples. Um, so it's it's about very intentionally um, making decisions about placements um, with things that they've just found. Um, it's about nature and you addressing nature and altering nature, but also the way nature uh, addresses or changes the artwork. There's some examples and then if you can look here is an example of sort of the critique process so the student uploaded their pictures and we have you know 15 comments about um, this person's work which is probably more than I would have gotten in class um, and so I really enjoyed the ability to use a, a project that would not normally have worked very well in a classroom setting um, and, and to have been able to use that. Um, and so that has really um, been sort of fun for me um, to be able to do some kind of different things than what I normally would have. Um, yeah, so I think that's uh, about it. I know that this is a little bit of a different thing than um, online labs and for science sort of based subjects. Um, and, and I don't have that much to look toward because I'm the only person that teaches 3D design. So um, that's a little bit, has been a little tricky as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. Um, I love the way um, that you, you did use the uh, the nature major project and, and used it based on where students are right now. Um, you know, going forward, we talk about when we get back to normal and you know we're gonna we're not gonna get back to where we were we will move forward to a new normal and all of you will be able to use you know things that you have um, that you have learned um, also, and, and go ahead I also want to say that um, one thing I liked about Facebook is that I um, I knew that some of my students were gonna have trouble um, with Wi-Fi access um, I know that you know it's something like 40% of the state doesn't have reliable Wi-Fi. Um, and, and so that's why one another reason why I, I chose the Facebook aspect as well, because I wanted them to be able to quickly and easily do things from their phone um, and get that out there. I noticed somebody, we, have a, yeah. we have a question about how you grade students' participation in that setting. Um, so per, I don't, so participation, um, 
So they have like, how do I purchase like their um, comments? So they're required to do a certain number of comments um, and everyone is required to comment on everyone's. Um, so they get that sort of participation aspect, if that's what you mean in terms of uh, other students besides the one like just uploading your own um, piece, which is obviously um, easy for me to see if you've participated. Um, but they do have a requirement for comments. Um, and I broke this down into three different projects. So they had to do it three times. They, um, they uploaded one one week and we discussed them and discussed whether or not the scope was uh, where it should be, whether they were spending enough time whether they were being as intentional with their placements so that then they had another week to sort of improve on and move from that first project that they did. Okay. I think there was All another right. question about Facebook. Um, I only had like two or three students that weren't on Facebook and they joined Facebook and they don't have to do anything. They don't have to friend anyone. They just have to um, search that classroom. So they don't actually have to do anything on Facebook, to participate in Facebook in any other way, um, except to join that group. And I'm, I'm kind of happy with it. I've had the students want to keep the Facebook group. They love the Facebook group and they want to keep uh, sort of in touch with each other after classes are over, so. Very good. Um, I think you've answered the questions that, that we had um, there and I'll be letting uh, Dr. Howard getting, be getting ready. Um, I believe he was ready to go. Um, and so I'll let you kind of scroll through if, and see if there's any other questions. And, I, and, and while Dr. Howard's getting ready, I, I also want to thank um, Tina Green. I know Tina's in there in the chat box answering questions, um, and Kylie Forsyth and uh, Tracy Craven. So, and so they're, they're over there answering questions. Be sure everybody goes and looks at the, the chat because there's some great conversation going on there. Um, and they may even put some things in there from an instructional design standpoint of how some of the ideas, um, you know, we might can fit them uh, in, a, in a design way um, as well that, that maybe meets some of the, the, the best practices, ideas and, and those kind of things. Um, but great conversation going on in the chat box as well. So, um, Dr. Howard, are you ready to go? All right, we're still not able to to hear you. So we will try again in a moment. We will go on to Dr. Swanson and um, Dr. Howard's calling me. So let me answer that. But uh, Dr. Swanson, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Seal. Um, it's not doctor, it's just Bob. Uh, and <laughs> uh, Dr. Nettles is uh, over in chemistry is gonna put me to shame physics department. I'm brand new uh, this year to Mississippi State. And so we're, Dr. Seal said, you know, don't try to duplicate what you do traditionally. That's exactly kind of my starting point because I've not done a lot of the labs. I'm really trying to make sure that the lecturers in our physics classes are happy with the lab, the online labs that we put out there. So I'm really just trying to, to, to check off uh, the bases. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully you're seeing. Um, I'll show you the grid that we normally have for uh, in our physics department. Let's see here. So these are all the different labs that we offer. We have six different lab courses, and there's usually 10 or 11 labs in each of those courses. Of course, when COVID hit, we had to kind of scramble get a couple of labs to finish out the semester. Uh, so I, I was really just kind of mining, you know, down here at the bottom, uh, kind of trying to quickly convert a couple of labs to be able to, to give the students enough grades to finish out the semester. So uh, for example, uh, one thing I will mention is Dr. Nettles said that 
the, the certain chemistry labs are worksheet and others are more lab reports. We have the same sort of thing. Our lower level labs are worksheet kind of based labs and the upper level labs, students do uh, lab reports. And so we kind of tackled them slightly differently. I'm gonna show you examples of the uh, lower level, the physics one, one, two, three. Um, I used two different approaches for a couple of the labs to finish out the semester. One was a grading spectrometer lab. And this is normally what the what the lab manual looks like. It's kind of the procedure that students would go through and you would fill out a worksheet and the worksheet Quick, can everyone hear me now? This is Isaac Howard. Can anyone hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, Isaac. Thank you. I'll sorry to interrupt. Finally. No worries. Yeah. Um, I'm going to show you the what the worksheet normally looks like. So normally the students would collect data during lab, and they would answer a couple of questions at the tail end. And so my approach for making this an online lab experience was to find a, a actually in, in this case, um, my, one of my TAs, my senior TA, she kind of developed a presentation um, bear with me. Um, yeah, there we go. She developed a presentation for this we want to throw it throw it into canvas and so the presentation is here um so it is powerpoint we loaded up as a pdf as well essentially showing the equipment that would normally be used um as well as then i created a, a worksheet in canvas students can go through and fill in their their information so they essentially I canvassized the worksheet that I showed earlier um, a lot of those are numerical values that are, they're going to put in there's a few essay questions that they little short answers that they need to, to fill in so that was more of a even though it's not really a video um, of the procedure it's at least a presentation of the procedure and then some canned data that the students would work with the other lab that I wound up canvassizing, um, I used more of a simulation approach. It's a specific heat lab. And so, um, normally the procedure looks like this. The students fill out a, a worksheet and they answer a few questions. And so I was able to find a online simulation that did very much what students would normally do in class. And so I created a lab activity in Canvas. And it's actually a, an activity that I've used before in my physical science class. And so I actually have some, some ready to go little tutorials. And the simulation looks like this. And in this case, it's a specific heat of a solid. And so students, uh, they, they have to learn how to use a, uh, they pull up this simulation. It's going to be different for every student. Um, but they they take a, uh, they, they read the triple beam balance. They have to take a screen grab and upload that to Canvas. So they, so they're going to upload, do a little file upload. So the TA has to then grade that and make sure the student knows how to read the triple beam balance for the empty cup, for the full cup, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they go through all those. They have to do a calculation in here. There's numerical values, that sort of thing. And so I essentially uh, use the simulation to replace the normal lab. Here's, that's the full cup with water. Here's a, a mystery solid. They have to get the mass of that. Essentially, you put the, the solid into a boiling beaker of water so it comes up to 100 degrees Celsius. Then you chunk the you chunk the, uh, the solid into a cup of water. We right now we're, we get the uh, current temperature. So 
when I click this next step, what the temperature probe is doing is it's measuring the temperature of the water currently. The next step is to take the hot metal, put it into the cup of cool water, and you can see the temperature of the water rise as heat energy leaves the solid and enters the water, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so that winds up being the activity. And there are a lot of good simulations out there. I use two main two main sources. There's a website called the Physics Aviary. It's actually a high school teacher in New Jersey who has made all these public domain simulations. And he's got scans and scans of them uh, on a lot of different physics topics. Some of them he has already written activities to and has YouTube videos that go along with them. Others, um, he doesn't have activities, but I'm able to write activities to, uh, to go along with them. Of course, another good resource is out of the University of Colorado Boulder, uh, something called FET. And the only suggestion I give for, for those who want to perhaps explore simulations as labs uh, is to make sure to use a, anything that, that you put up online really has to be HTML5. Uh, there are simulations out there that are Java or Flash based and they just don't play very well. Flash is going away at the end of this calendar year. A lot of browsers don't support it. Certainly mobile devices don't use uh, Flash or Java very well. So um, you know, HTML5, I kind of make that a requirement if I'm gonna put anything up online, uh, that's kind of where I go for that. Um, and I guess that, that's kind of you know, what, what, I've, what I've done so far. I've leaned mostly simulations. I am gonna hopefully do more videos of my TAs, especially in some of the higher level labs. Uh, we've been out of Hilden now for several weeks, so I've not gotten a chance to, to video all the uh, students I would like. And uh, just bouncing off of, uh, of Rowan Hogg's uh, presentation, I wanted to share something that I found very useful in my lecture class. Uh, I teach astronomy lecture physics 1063 and I had a on my syllabus I had a group assignment a group project that was supposed to be done after spring break I was going to have students go as groups to the library to the digital media center and experience a astronomy related VR experience uh, and they were supposed to make videos and that was going to be their project of course that never happened so uh, I wound up turning it into an individual project not a group project and my students are familiar with something called Flipgrid. And if you've not used Flipgrid before, it is deployable in, um, in Canvas. It's an app in Canvas. And it's essentially, it's a way of students posting little videos. Um, they can be, I, I made this assignment five to 10 minutes. And so students you know, created little videos about an astronomy topic of their choosing. And, uh, Cool thing is that these are now available for any student to view, as well as for me to view. Let's see, that's not a great one. Um, some of them got very, very creative, uh, and I had a pretty good, pretty good uh, participation as well. Um, so other students can learn about uh, different astronomy topics. This was this one was kind of funny. This guy got his. Uh, two brothers involved and they kind of did an Indiana Jones spoof. They pretended they were visiting Venus and uh, they really kind of went, up, went all in on it. And uh, so it showed a great amount of creativity, uh, got family involved in their project while they're all sheltering in place. And so I wanted being a, uh, I thought a pretty good, pretty good result from that assignment. So that's where things stand from the physics department. And like I said, now I've got the big challenge of, you know, I've only gotten, you know, to finish out the semester, I knocked out two or, two or three labs in each of those lab sections or those lab courses. Uh, now, of course, I've got to come up with a full suite of labs for the, for the summer. So that's gonna be my next, that'll be the project over the next month. Sounds like you'll be busy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, that was, uh, that was very good. Um, I was looking, there's been some discussion about some of the, the lecture simulations. Um, I think most everything has been answered. Uh, Colin made a good point about accessibility um, and, and something that is important for, for labs as well as lectures. And, and that's something we can help you with as well. Tracy's been doing a lot of um, 
uh, research and studying on accessibility in online courses. And so keep that in mind with, with uh, all of your courses. And it's not just about, well, I don't have anybody in my class that needs that. Um, it's really for all of your students and it can be used um, uh, beneficial in a lot of different ways. So we will move on to uh, Dr. Howard. He, he's been teasing us the whole time. So uh, we, are, we are now uh, on the edge of our seat, Dr. Howard. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Can you hear me? You can't hear me? Yes. Outstanding. Outstanding. Well, thank you. And sorry for the, the video troubles. I really don't know what happened. I just shut everything off and brought it back up and it worked fine. But uh, what Dr. Seal is doing with this is she wanted to show you a contrast. She's been showing you all the good teachers on campus and then she got me in here as well. So that way you could see how big the gap really is. But what I'm doing is I'm teaching a construction materials class this semester and it's got a laboratory associated with it. So this would be things like asphalt, concrete, you know, building type materials. You build roads, bridges, buildings, things of that nature out of. And I guess before I explain what we've been doing, I should tell you that everything we did and everything that I've been doing was in response to COVID-19. It really wasn't intended to be summer activities or previous fall. It was this just happened, what can we get, What can we do to get through the semester in the most effective way possible? So some of the things that we did, if I were gonna do them for the summer, I would do them different. But ultimately once this happened and the extended spring break happened, I sat there for, I guess, a fairly brief amount of time and ultimately decided that a good decision now was gonna be better for this semester than to wait and see what happened. And I was still on campus at the time. We were still allowed to be there. I had some uh, students in the lab doing research and things like that. And what I started to do is in the College of Engineering, we do a lot of video courses for our graduate students. And we have a pretty nice setup to do those sorts of things. And so I made arrangements with the uh, video group in the distance education department in the college. And they videoed me for hours and hours for lecture. And I would go in there and just spend the day for the most part and did that first. So I got all my lecture classes taken care of where the students could see me in a classroom setting for lecture. As soon as that was over, I transitioned to the laboratory. And in the laboratory effectively did somewhat, kind of a similar thing, was in the lab instead of the distance classroom, but ended up recording about, looks like I've got some cheat sheet on, below average teachers would cheat, but ended up making 19 videos of kind of like a cooking show. For those of you that like to watch cooking shows, sort of made these videos it would be somewhere in the four to seven minute range where it would show me doing some critical activity of how to make concrete or how to make asphalt or how to test it or whatever and we would get to that get through that step and then we turn the video off we turn the video back on but as soon as we turn the video back on we had the one from yesterday that I'd made yesterday in the oven ready to come out so to speak and so they just systematically walked through three or four hours of experiments in probably 20 or 30 minutes. You know, we, we skipped right to the, what I thought were the most critical part. So it was very, again, you know, next day type start thing. So it wasn't rehearsed, it wasn't practiced. It didn't have a lot of animations. It was just, I got one of my graduate students, we had a camcorder. I said, hey, get this camcorder and start recording me. And, and so it was very, you know, kind of off the cuff like that. But. I feel like that works okay this semester just because the students themselves, once I put this stuff out there for the students, I started getting a lot of emails from them that they really appreciated having all the content for the rest of the semester early in the process. And that was kind of my goal is by the time they got back from their extended spring break, everything that they needed was sitting there either in Canvas or in some cases I used a Google Drive account that they could access. And so by the time they got back from extended spring break, every video they needed for the rest of the semester, be it lecture, um, lab video, assignment, everything was available. And I did that for one of the reasons that was mentioned earlier. I didn't know that it was 40%, but I did was aware that internet connections were gonna be a major problem. Even in places like Starkville, where you've got all these students that are now sitting in an apartment complex and they all have to at eight o'clock in the morning start streaming a class video, well, that's just a problem waiting to happen on the internet. And so I felt like putting all these videos of both the class and the lecture out in the beginning would allow a student to, during an off time or maybe even one time, go download everything they need for the entire semester to their computer and be completely independent of the internet except for exams and a few other miscellaneous things like that. The other thing that we did is we tried to be very organized in the way we communicated to students because realizing that students were going to start getting just dozens and dozens and dozens of emails and 
and contacts in all different facets. I expected that was going to make it difficult for them to stay organized because, well, most of our students are probably not as organized as, as they think they are sometimes. And so what we did is we put one long email together that had a very systematic list of things that they needed to do for the rest of the semester and called it update number one, sent it to them. And then every time I needed to communicate with the students, I would reply to that email, change the update one to update two, and was very systematic. So they had a nice thread of everything that was going on all semester. So those were probably the main things that we did. Now, in the in the risk of me actually using technology, I'm going to try to share my screen here and let you see. I'm going to try to let you see. I've got the Google Drive. Well, it should be. So this is, uh, can you see the screen? I hope you can. But this is sort of what the videos look like. Yes. And the idea of the videos, and I'm not going to play all 19 of them. I know all of you are probably about to sleep already, but it just gives you a general feel. I'll just click on one at random and just kind of show you what they look like. See, they're, they're not on a video. See? That is your seat. You can kind of get the basic idea. It's just me walking through all the different things that they would have been doing and seeing. So that, that's kind of just the gist of the videos is it would be, you know, when you when you t make an asphalt pavement, you don't want it to rut under heavy traffic and you don't want it to be tore up when, the, when it rains. And the idea of that tracker is to give you an assessment of whether or not a mix is going to do those things. And so what we did is we actually made their asphalt for them. It was in the wheel tracker rutting there while I was talking. And that video is four minutes and looks like 36 seconds. And so there's just a bunch of those videos that systematically walk the students through. But they were videos of their experiments and videos where the student, where one of my graduate students was just videoing me doing them. But again, they were, they weren't really practiced. They weren't rehearsed. And, you know, if they weren't just right, we uploaded them anyway, because we were trying to get information out to them relatively quickly. So other than that, I can't think of anything. Well, one other thing that we did that was also mentioned earlier is we modified the assignments a good bit uh, relative to what they would have had in the beginning, because I felt like giving them several small assignments was going to create more confusion than taking all those different things that we were trying to do with the several small assignments and rolling them into, say, one bigger assignment where the one bigger assignment was about everything that they were talking about with asphalt. So we did do that. So instead of giving them, say, an assignment for this week's lab, an assignment for next week's lab. We took two or three weeks worth of asphalt labs, made one large assignment, and gave them two or three options to do it. One of the options that was the video that was mentioned earlier. We allowed them to record a video of themselves talking about specific matters related to the testing and upload it to Canvas. They could do a written assignment. So we gave them two or three options for how to do the different assignments because we felt like that flexibility would help them out as well. So. Again, I don't, I don't have any real specific uh, things beyond that, but that's what we did. We, you know, basically, basically based on two principles, get them everything they need as soon as we possibly can, because that let them get started on one of their classes where maybe some of the others were still working on their content and be very organized with the communications, keep things in a real systematic way. For them. But other than that, we really don't know that we deviated a tremendous amount from the original plan. Very good. One thing you said right there at the end, and communication, and, and that's something that's a key, particularly this semester when students were scared to death, didn't know what was going on, didn't know, um, you know, what to expect, changes were going on, but that's really important anytime in an online class because they're sitting out there and they need that, that uh, continual communication, even if it's just to touch base and say, I, you know, we were telling people you can touch base and say I don't know yet, but just so they know, 
that you haven't forgotten them and that they're out there. But that engagement piece is really important. Um, One thing, Andrew, how, did, did you ask students to purchase things on their own or no. did anybody else? One of the one of the things I guess I'm in a somewhat fortunate position. I'm fairly. I've got a lot of industry partners that support us on various things, and there were a couple of needs that we had this semester related to this, and we just had industry people pay for what they needed, so we we didn't make students buy anything. The one thing I was going to say about distance teaching in general is I do feel like it's very important for you as the person teaching the course to front load your work. So if you're teaching a class, if I was teaching a class in person, the amount of work that I would do per month might be relatively uniform throughout a four or five month semester. But if I was teaching the exact same class via distance, the amount of hours I would spend in the earlier parts of the semester would be disproportional to the end because getting ahead of the online process to me is very important because if it ever gets on top of you schedule wise, I think it would be very difficult to get it back. You know, doing all that prep work and the things that were being talked about ahead of time. It's important on, on campus, but I feel like it's more important when you don't have access to the students face to face. Excellent. Thank you. And I'll let you peruse the uh, chat box as well, see if there's some um, things in there that you might want to uh, answer. Um, I see somebody ask, uh, how do you test the students on a lab experiment uh, or project? Past, I asked students to form a group, conduct an experiment, generate results, analyze, and submit a report to me. Uh, what may be an alternate uh, to this when we move to online labs? The alternate, the, the one alternate that we've started to use, which fortunately in this lab we've been doing a lot of this, is really just doing presentations. This lab, normally when students take it, they have to do three what we call panels. And the panel is myself and a group of my friends from industry, and it's different every semester, but there'll be five or six of us that will be just sitting in a conference room. The student will come into the room. They've got, an, they've got their assignment. They were given the assignments on the first day of the semester. You know, on this date, you'll be coming and giving a panel on this subject, on this day. So again, that front load effort thing. But it's, a, it's an assignment about the tests they've been doing, the lectures, whatnot. They walk into the conference room and their assignments make us believe you. And that, yes, that scares them to death. I understand that, but they're gonna to have to do that in their professional life. It's just a, it's an inevitable, inevitable reality. If they're gonna be successful professionally, they have to be able to walk into a conference room with a handful of people and make them believe them. It's just simply required in any field. But, so we took that same basic idea of the panel and we gave the students the option is if you don't want to write a report or do these other options, you can record yourself giving your panel to us upload it to canvas and we'll grade your presentation and i feel like that's a pretty good way to do it because at a minimum you can guarantee that it's them in front of you that's saying those words now who who helped them or whatever obviously you can't control everything in the online environment but it gives you for me anyway at least some assurance that that person was engaged in that content when they have to actually speak to you on a video and we had several students do it. And, and as mentioned earlier, I didn't repeat that. Some of the notes I had other presenters has already covered, but Canvas has the ability to upload videos too. And that, that to me has been very helpful with this um, transition to online. We were using it before on a couple of rare occasions, but with this, it's been very handy. Very good. And one of the things that we have really been, um, I say, you know, preaching a little bit, and I heard somebody at a conference uh, say this, that they were doing something really creative, and I said, you know, how did you as a faculty member come up with this creative idea or, you know, find this technology, um, because you have so many other things to, to do, and her answer was, I start with the assumption that whatever I want to do in the online environment, there's a technology for that, and so we, we encourage you, even if you don't know what it is, if you want to call us or, or um, CTL, ITS, library, and say, hey, I want to do this thing. I want to accomplish this outcome. Can you help me figure out how to do that? And we can we can all certainly certainly help you because just, you know, in the in the chat box, there are different um, uh, technologies that are available to accomplish what you want to accomplish. So, all right, our- um, Dr. Last, Yes. 
Sorry, before you move on, there are a couple of questions in the chat box about lab fees and if um, we are maybe expecting students over the summer to buy um, their own supplies to conduct some of the labs. Do you maybe have any insight on that? Uh, I, I, I don't. I mean, I, I'm guessing that's going to be um, course by, by course, just like it would be for, for other in some some classes that are face to face. Maybe there are lab fees that students have, whereas in others they're not. So there's not a, a general idea about um, lab fees that I, that I know of. Um, all right, so um, Bonnie Thornton with the library, uh, she is with us to talk a little bit about um, resources that the library uh, has. She just posted a link in the chat box. And so Bonnie, I will turn it over to you. All right, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, post a link in the chat box here and this is the guide that I'm going to be um, sharing with you today. It pulls together just a few of the open source software that we have um, made available uh, and I'd just like you to keep in mind throughout this that this guide is as much yours as it is something we've generated for ideas so if there's anything on, that you think should be on here that would be helpful do not hesitate to email the library um, like Susan said, thank you. My name is Bonnie. I'm the electronic resources librarian. Often you will not be in contact with me. Um, usually I am put in contact with people if there is an issue accessing a resource off campus, um, which, you know, is we're finding issues much more now that everyone's remote and there's been a massive increase in volume of people act, trying to access resources. And so vendors, campuses, patrons, it's just been a learning curve for everyone. Um, or you'll be put into contact with me if you're looking for an online resource that requires a subscription or a payment. So I know we looked briefly into Labster, it was decided not to get that, um, and I work with vendors to secure price quotes, simultaneous users, etc. And before I go over briefly this guide, I just want to say, if you are looking into having your students purchase materials, or if you're looking to use physical materials, look now. Um, when I worked with a couple of vendors that provided science kits, they were already reaching max capacity for their summer term two weeks ago uh, because we are not the only university in this situation. Of course, it's campus wide, it's worldwide. So there is right now um, a temporary shortage in the supply chain just because um, those resources are being spoken for as everyone has rapidly moved everything online. Um, so that's something else I think you might want to consider when you're moving your courses online. If there's something you have in mind that you want to be students to work physically um, with that material, look now, but also have a plan B just in the off chance that material might not be readily available for those students. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen now. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so I have my screen shared here. This guide is available on the library main page. If you went to the research guides, just typed in remote teaching resources. It's also on our library COVID response page. So you will be able to locate it fairly promptly. Um, this guide is intended primarily for STEM courses. Um, so, there are a couple of articles that have been circulating that if you need some ideas or just some reassurances, um, Heather Taft uh, wrote an article about how to move a lab course online safely. Um, and so there's a few ideas to generate there from her experiences because she has years of experience teaching courses online. Um, and John Loike and Marion Stolz Loike, um, they did this prior to COVID. Uh, so they were distance educators um, and identified if you wanna put in a bit more or enhance your syllabi that you have already, they have objective-based lab course teaching. And I'm sure you all have worked through your objectives so far, but if you would like some more ideas, maybe just go ahead and take a couple of minutes to read it. They're very quick reads and they're very helpful. So I already have these pulled up in the tabs, but these are some free open source software um, that's crowdsourced by educators such as yourselves. Um, 
that are available for use. Um, so biointeractive, I'm just gonna show you these tabs really quick. FET we've already went over. Um, biointeractive has different assignments, activities, videos, um, and you can filter by um, subject. It is biology focused, um, which is indicative by the title. Um, but if you were looking for activities or interactive media, something to get your students to engage with that assignment, you could go ahead and explore by subject to see if there's any supplemental material that might assist you. You can filter by level. So I've already pre-filtered this to college level. Um, as professors, of course, knowing what you're going to be teaching, um, it would be up to you to assess whether this would be best or not for your students at their level. Um, but it might be something worth considering. Uh, these videos you can integrate into Canvas. Um, I would contact CTL most likely to see if you have uh, need help integrating these into Canvas or um, the library. I know Blair Booker is our distance librarian. I'm going to do a shout out to her. She works a lot with remote resource integration. Chem Collective is really nice um, for just general chemistry breakdowns. They have here this virtual lab uh, you can go. And I fully recommend on every single one of these to consult the tutorials. Because they've been crowdsourced and developed for everybody, absolutely consult the help pages before you jump right in because it'll make it go so much smoother. What seems nice about this one is there are already basic chemistry experiments set up um, for you. So there's a workbench, if you will, a virtual workbench where you can add different um, chemicals, different tools, different glassware that students can interact with. There are assignments here as well that you can preload. Um, let's see here. If you go to the file, uh, you can load assignments. Um, I am not a chemist. I do not have a strong chemistry background. Um, people who have strong chemistry backgrounds develop this. Uh, so if you're teaching an intro chem class, I would recommend looking into this potentially. Um, as you can see, they break it down um, by subject. So this is just another resource to consider. Harvard um, Lab Exchange, this is best for biotech simulations. Um, Another thing I should just point out is with all of these, create a personal account and encourage your students to create an account for access. It can just store your information a little bit more quickly. And as a user, when you're going into this, um, it just is for ease of access. So here there are different simulations you can have for coding DNA. Um, I already created mine. So if you go to an account, it only takes about a minute to activate um, and go ahead and log in. Let's see here. Oops, not my password. There we go. Okay, so you can start searching by topics. Um, if you know someone in the field who's contributed to this, you can search by people, um, but you could just go ahead into these different clusters, these different educational clusters, and it'll have different videos, assignments, and things to explore. Alternatively, Merlot. Um, so this Merlot comes out of California State University. Their consortia developed this open source. Um, is much more interdisciplinary. Uh, so there are a few things on here that you'll notice are for writing based, like writing assignment type of labs or primary source document research. Um, but you can filter by discipline. Uh, here I've narrowed it down already just for sake of time, but you can filter by college, you can filter by grade level, um, you can filter by whether these have been peer reviewed or not, um, these experiments or these simulations and whether it has learning exercises. So if you don't want any of those, you can just unclick those boxes. It's just your basic filter. Um, so I would recommend taking some time to see if there are different things to add. There's DNA, there's chemistry, there's biology, there's different basic mathematical principles. There are some uh, basic physics um, as well. If I'm on Merlot materials, I've already filtered this down for you. But if you went ahead to the home page and you wanted to start, um, you just do keyword search here, or you could go up to this browse. Wait, no, 
Hold on. And then I would say go to view discipline index and select your discipline. And that will narrow down the materials access that it has for you. So if we do it mathematical mathematics, click on materials and it'll have what's already been crowdsourced and published on this site. And if when you're developing all of these videos, you found something that you think would be worth sharing on the site, you could go ahead and submit it for review for publication for other educators in the future. Um, let's see. So this one modular is chemistry focused. This is the only one of the resources that is specific for tablet or phone. All of these other resources strongly encourage your students to use either a Chromebook, a notebook or a laptop. They just are going to be very clunky if they're trying to use them on a phone. Um, this basically is um, a tool that's been created for students to simulate and create molecular structures for organic chemistry. Um, and they're offering, during the COVID crisis, they're offering free, um, they're offering this for free for faculty. Hold on, it's going ahead. Let's see, I'm going to click on the next one over. Um, so in the LibGuide, I have a link for faculty to sign up. You can go ahead and download it, create your account, and then faculty, you go ahead and fill out a form and you'll be given a code that will assist you with making this more widely accessible to your students. Um, FET uh, went over this and a couple of others mentioned that it was very helpful for them for simulations and it really is. They do a really great job. Another nice thing about this is um, the simulations can be downloaded if a student is at a place that has Wi-Fi and then access it offline. So that is something you may want to consider when you're looking at these simulations. Um, I won't go into too many of them, but you can again go by chemistry, earth science, math. Um, just to get the basics and see if it might be anything that could potentially enhance your course. Um, it's a pretty well used resource, a more respected resource. Um, and the last one I have, these are just some very basic videos. Um, I know Whitney and Nettles, they, she, they did a really excellent job with their longer videos, but if you just want to have like a brief one minute, two minutes, something that's already been made, um, Val is was developed in the UK. Um, it's an open educational resource and it has a series of short videos that will just show um, the techniques of pipetting, weighing things out, um, cutting lab samples into dishes. Sorry, that probably sounded sciencey. It was not sciencey at all, but um, you can go ahead and um, just peruse these and see if it's anything you might want to add just in case you don't have the time to make that video. Um, you could link to these resources for those students just to have that for reference. Um, Val, I would say the Val of the resources is not interactive in that it has assignments. It's not really doing simulations that students can engage with or you can base your assignments per se, but it is good just for looking at those um, sort of introductory aspects of that cert specific lab work. Um, so those are the open source that we found that were the best views that other universities are re promoting at this time. We also currently have access to Jove. I will say this access at the end of summer is going to go away. I'm currently working with a vendor to extend access through summer term. Right now we only have access through June 15th. Um, and I'm currently working to try to get access to the end of summer, but this is a resource at this time we are not looking into acquiring. However, for distance education, they do have good videos on lab protocol that you might want to consult and they show um, different professors conducting their experiments that students can follow through with that. Um, so that's primarily what I wanted to show you. Um, the library is offering services during coronavirus. You could go ahead. Um, this is just the brief link to those guys of everything we're offering, um, who to contact, how to format, how to get access if you can't get access to things, um, if you're like just beating your head against the wall. Um, there's a comprehensive list of vendors that are providing temporary access options during COVID-19. Um, this list is constantly in flux. Um, I'm keeping a tab on it. Some vendors have extended uh, access. Some vendors, like I said before, were their systems were completely overloaded by the massive increase in volume of users and so were temporarily shut down and so they restored access. 
um, and it are changing their deadlines of uh, dates of access because of that. Um, so keep checking back on this page. It won't be as specific for labs, but if you want students to dive in to see if there might be any science journals to supplement what you might have them be doing, in addition to our regular resources, this might be a good place for them to jump in, at least temporarily. Um, and in the meantime, though, go ahead and just contact the library. Um, I listed Li Zhang at the top. She is our um, science and engineering subject specialist. Brad Brazil, a lot of you have worked with, um, focuses on agriculture and forestry. Derek Marshall is the vet med librarian. Melanie Thomas is Meridian librarian, and she also works a lot with uh, students who work with a variety of um, entry into PA and nursing as well. Um, but in general, you could just submit a general help ticket to the library, or you could just go ahead and call at any time. Someone will answer you, and if they aren't that person, they'll put you in touch with the right person for that. Um, and like I said, Blair Booker, uh, she's not listed on here, but she focuses, she's our distance learning librarian, so we'll have experience working with this. So I'd say, when in doubt, contact the library. If you're having issues, check what browser you're using. So almost always use Chrome or Mozilla Firefox. See if you're connected to a VPN or not. Um, that will resolve a lot of issues if you can connect to the VPN and um, make sure you're using a laptop. I will say um, Mississippi does have a unique challenge in that our students do not, depending where they live, may not have good access to internet. Um, a lot of public libraries throughout the state have really beefed up their Wi-Fi to extend to the parking lot and are implementing hotspots um, if the student isn't able to access a hotspot. So I will go ahead and post in the MSU staff and faculty group, Mississippi Library Association has created a map of where free Wi-Fi is available in parking lots throughout the state. So I'll go ahead and share that again. It's been shared a couple of times before. Um, so in case students don't know where to go, they might just be able to go park a car, just go sit in a parking lot at any one of those libraries or McDonald's because McDonald's is actually pretty excellent at providing good Wi-Fi. Um, I've used them before in a pinch to take a test. So um, that's primarily what I have to say. Thank you very much, Mike. That's excellent resources. Um, thank you for walking us uh, through that. There's been some great resources today, some great conversation. I appreciate, again, um, uh, all of our presenters uh, today just sharing some ideas. And I encourage you, uh, any of you who say, hey, I want to I use some of these things um, this summer, uh, please work with us. And I put our, um, our link up there that takes you to our faculty resources page. Call us, CTL, library. ITS to make sure that you're uh, designing your course. It's not just about using some of the elements, but designing it well, so students spend their time learning, not trying to find things or, or whatever. So we are happy to work with you. You've got some great resources here, both from the standpoint of technical resources and uh, people. So um, our next training session that we have scheduled right now, but you know, please let us know if there's other things you wanna learn uh, learn about or hear about, but one we have is May 14th that will be uh, an HonorLock training um, by HonorLock. So HonorLock is our um, on-demand proctoring system that we uh, will be will have um, for summer and for next year, and it's a very robust system um, and works within the uh, with within Chrome and uh, within Canvas. So that's our next one, be May 14th, but that'll be on our resources page and any other trainings that we come up with. And I know ITS um, has training sessions uh, as well. So thank you all for, for being here today. If there's any other questions, we'll hang around for a few minutes if you wanna put some of those in uh, the chat box. And again, uh, let's see, we have a question. Does Honorlock prevent screen capture? So yeah, they're answering that. Um, photographing the screen with the phones to prevent cheating. So yes, it does. Susan, it's, it's a very robust. Does somebody want to 
Yeah, can I jump in real quick? So I just saw something, a person asked if we can help if a course is on a distance course. Um, I did emphasize distance courses because we've all been moved into distance teaching at this time. Uh, But however, the librarians are here to help you regardless of what your course is. So it does not have to have been a distance course primarily. Um, Actually, right now, the subject specialists are working very hard to get in contact with everyone offering a summer course to identify them and to reach out. So be on the lookout for an email for that. If you don't hear back, contact your department head or reach out to the library directly. And those librarians can assist you with getting items ready for your courses for this summer. Thank you. And we, I said we're recording this, so we will put this on our faculty um, resources page at um, online.msstate.edu. So uh, again, we'll hang around and chat for a a few minutes. uh, Any other questions you have? And thank you all for being here today. Hey, Kristen, um, you're asking if we've got any um, specific ideas for statistics. Could you maybe tell us a little bit more about what your labs look like anyway? Um, If we get an idea of maybe what you normally do, we can maybe help you think of some ways to um, move it online as it were. I guess I'm just um, I'm good with, you know, making short videos about using our statistical package, but just formulas and and allowing students to enter things into formulas where it it's not a challenge to put the number in the right place kind of thing is really what I'm wondering if there's something out there. So um, we, I do have a software. So here's the thing, the software you do technically have to pay for, but they do kind of allow free demos on their website. And so if you have students who need to type out formulas, what they can do is just go to the website, type out the formula here and then copy and paste it to wherever you need it. But it's called math type. And I'm gonna put that in the chat box. That would be great. That's really kind of, I mean, you know, I, I kind of managed everything else. Um, but, you know, I mean, they can print out things and then upload them, um, you know, but just right. The cool the thing about, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, the cool thing about this is that it has like a traditional equation editor, but then it also will allow you to switch um, what they call modes. And then you can just draw everything with your mouse and it converts what you draw into um, like typed equations. So that's kind of what I like about it. not for free but you can use their free um, tester on their website and generally speaking um, copy and paste is enough for what we need it for okay I mean you know I've I've typed all the things in I just you know I I created a template for the students for you know the class I mean I know this is a lab thing but you know we also use the formulas in in lab but um, you know, where basically I provided the formulas instead of the students having to pick the formula and put it in and put the numbers in the right place. You know, I, I basically rescued or, you know, provided a lot of the steps for them in the quick conversion. I just didn't know if there was things to explore um, outside of that. Yeah, I would, de- I would definitely look at math type. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, anytime.